One area where it is hoped the genome might provide a direct benefit is in medicine. There is particular interest in a genetic disease that currently kills one in three of us, cancer. It has been called the primary disease of the genome, but already the genome sequence is revolutionizing the way we understand and treat cancer. Lydia has cancer, a fairly rare cancer called large B-cell lymphoma. So does Mary and Joshua. Until now, they would have received the same diagnosis and the same treatment because they have the same disease. But the DNA in the tumors tells a different story. Sequencing DNA is pretty fast these days, but it is still a specialist job and takes too long for doctors planning cancer treatment. So here at the National Cancer Institute in Maryland, Lou Stoud and his colleagues are using a tool that they hope will make reading genes just like any other blood test. They call it the DNA chip, and they hope it will do for cancer diagnosis what the integrated circuit has done for electronics. This is cancer diagnosis on an industrial scale. The robot is making a hundred chips, each able to test for 15,000 genes at the same time. The chip is a sliver of glass with single-strand DNA stuck to its surface. Each tiny dot contains DNA from a different gene you are interested in. The idea is to find out which genes are actually switched on in the tumor. A switched-on gene produces messenger, a copy of the gene which is on its way to code for protein. To see where it goes, the messenger is made fluorescent. When the messenger is washed over the chip, it sticks only to DNA with exactly the same sequence, leaving a fluorescent spot. Here, tumor DNA is being tested to see which genes are turned on or off compared to normal tissue. Tumor DNA glows red, normal DNA glows green. So red spots are where a gene is switched on only in the tumor. Just as important, the green spots are where a gene is on in normal tissue but has been switched off in the tumor, and where it is turned on in both, the gene glows yellow. Well, I think we're going to rewrite the textbooks of cancer diagnosis. We have traditionally talked about cancers in terms of what the cells look like under the microscope, where they are in the body. Now we're going to rewrite these definitions in terms of the molecules that are abnormal in given cancer types. And what we're finding with our genomic tools is that what we once thought was a single disease, and in the textbook is written as such, is now multiple diseases that have different molecular abnormalities. With DNA chips, you can test for thousands of genes at the same time, and already it is making physicians think again about how they treat some cancers. All the patients we looked at had been given this one diagnosis, but when we then looked at which genes were active in the tumors of these patients, we found there were at least two types uh, that each type resembled a different normal cell in the body and the patients with these two types of lymphoma had dramatically different clinical outcomes. In particular, they found they could predict ahead of time which patients would fail to respond to chemotherapy. Instead, they could be given bone marrow transplants right away when they had the greatest chance of success. The new technology is also rewriting our understanding of what cancer is and the lengths your cells go to to stop it happening. Cancer is the genetic program gone awry. So cancer is many different diseases. In fact, probably almost as many dise different diseases as there are different cell types in the body. So cancer arises from a normal cell type and then genetic changes take place in the genome of the cancer cell, causing it, its wiring, its molecular machinery to be different from a normal cell. But where cystic fibrosis is caused by a faulty gene passed on to us by our parents, the fault in cancer usually happens after we are born. Our cells are under constant attack from radiation and chemicals that can cause mutations in their DNA. Now, most of those alterations in the DNA of individual cells make no difference at all. 
the cell just works perfectly well. Some of those alterations may cause the cell to die, in which case the body also is fine because it doesn't need the occasional cell, it can just lose it. But very occasionally, an individual cell will acquire an abnormality in its DNA sequence within a critical gene that will cause that cell to proliferate, to grow when it should stop growing, to move out into the surrounding tissues when it should be staying put, and ultimately to move off into the bloodstream and spread. In other words, this cell has acquired the behavior that we associate with cancer cells. And it is now becoming clear that to get cancer, we need not one mutation, but many. For the average adult cancer to develop, you may need 20, it may be even 100 different abnormalities. Now is the time that we can find out because we have all the genes available to us to look at.